Greetings fellow Conquerors, this is Darkfire Slide, and today I want to talk about how vassals are probably more important than you realize when it comes to playing EU4 successfully. I want you to think back to a time you were watching one of your favorite YouTubers, and you'll find, I think, that a common thread between all of them is that a good EU4 player knows when to take vassals and why to take vassals. And today I kind of want to go into the usefulness of vassals as, as a gameplay mechanic and why you should take them, especially if you don't take vassals at all, why it's really, really important for you to be able to do that. So first, let's go over the number of benefits that you get out of a vassal. So one of the first things that you get out of a vassal is that you get income. Um, vassals pay you a certain amount of ducats a month based on your government type and whether or not you have ideas and policies that increase the amount of income that you can actually get. In the vassal screen, there is actually a percentage that shows what percentage of their national income they are paying to their overlord. And if you get the vassal income number to 100%, your vassals are actually paying you everything that they own. Um, which can be a good and a bad thing, because obviously, um, <laughs> if they're paying you everything they have, they can't support troops, which are the other thing that make vassals very useful. Now, smaller vassals are only going to be able to support about 3,000 troops, especially one province miners. Um, and while this may not seem like a lot, uh, vassals can do a lot of really interesting things when it comes to um, sieges especially. Um, they can siege capital forts with 3,000 troops, and they can also go around the countryside sieging things and also take back provinces in your country that maybe you don't want to go back and siege. Now, the larger your vassals get, the more important this becomes. And especially because uh, you can turn a vassal into what's called a march, which increases their force limit, their manpower pool, and all these other nice things that make them a lot better at fighting. Um, and, and we'll talk a bit about why those are important. But uh, vassals also provide you, in addition to income, with a force limit bonus. So every vassal you have increases your overall force limit by plus one. If you get the last idea of influence ideas, this increases to plus two. And if you have that, it, additionally, with offensive or aristocratic ideas and a policy, you can actually get that up to plus three per vassal, although how useful that actually is at that point uh, is hard to say. Now, the most important thing about vassals, though, and the reason that they're so useful in EU4 is because when you annex a vassal, it costs diplomatic points instead of administrative points. Now, this is useful for a number of reasons, and what I generally find is that diplomatic points are the points that you use the least when it comes to warfare, which is kind of the mainstay of EU4 because it is sort of a war game. Now, <clears throat> because because that's the way that is, if you have, especially if you have a leader with bad admin skill, um, it can often be extremely beneficial to take a country as a vassal instead of just taking their land because. Uh, of that problem of you not having enough admin points and so the most important thing about vassals is that they allow you to keep up with technology and the, and the problem is of course with administrative technology if you're spending all your admin points annexing uh, provinces you're not spending it getting tech and as we can see here in this save um, I'm already lagging behind even in the very early game on my admin tech just because I've had to take so much land now the amount of points that a, a vassal costs is about the same as it will cost a core, except it costs diplomatic points instead of admin points. So if you've got a nation with 20 development uh, that you want to annex, one of your vassals, that's going to cost 200 diplo points, uh, whereas normally that same amount of land would have cost 200 admin points, uh, being at 10 points per, pro uh, per development. <clears throat> now, vassals do have, you know... A problem and that's that they can become disloyal very easily uh, if they manage to overpower their overlord so when you take vassals you always need to kind of balance how strong you are with how strong your vassals are and if you get a little too eager like I believe in this save Okay, so in this save, we can see that um, I, I've grown a little bit since the start of the game, about 34 years after the game start. I'm at about 131 development, um, not including, you know, autonomy. Um, and for vassals, I have a 34, 
a 38, and a 20. So, you know, if we add all of that together, we get a little over, um, I, I think a little over 90, maybe just a little bit over 80 development uh, combined. And that is more than half of what I am able to feel <laughs> um, in terms of like a country. So they have over half of what the development I actually have. And so in, th in this scenario, I've gotten a little bit over eager with my vassals. And later on in this save, what ended up happening is that this vassal here, Arakan, uh, ends up asking Ming China uh, for independence. And this is important. Any nation that gets over 50% liberty desire, as you, uh, as you can see in your vassal screen, um, can ask other nations for independence uh, to support them. And what happens is, if a nation gets that support, um, if they declare war on you, that supporting nation is immediately dragged into a war for their independence. So, if you get into a scenario like that, with a country that you know is going to destroy you... Now, thankfully, in this case, Ming isn't able to attack me because I'm their subject, because of the tributary nation mechanic uh, in Asia with Mandate of Heaven. Um... Normally, what you what you should do in that scenario is just release the country that is being problematic, um, get a little larger, maybe annex one of your smaller vassals. Um, in this case, I, I vouch to annex Pegu, and after that, um, I was big enough at that point that I could attack Arakan again um, easily win a siege against them because they were mostly by themselves after a five-year truce. And then vassalize them again, this time their liberty desire being much lower because um, I, I didn't have as many vassals to deal with. Now, in, in addition to asking for their own independence, uh, disloyal vassals, uh, ones that don't like you, usually ones you've just taken or ones that are too big, um, they don't pay you and they won't fight in your wars. So two of the biggest reasons that you, well, two of the main reasons you take a vassal are gone if the vassal doesn't actually like you. To help counteract this, you can improve relations with a vassal up to plus 200 instead of the regular plus 100 that you would get with an independent nation. Um, this is especially important if you took a vassal violently in a war, instead of um, asking them. And how that works is, if you are a large enough nation, uh, usually ten times the size of a nation, or, or at least five times the size of a nation, you can actually ask a, country, a small country, you know, one that's at least five times smaller than you, um, if they want to be your vassal, but they have to have 190 opinion of you. And you can get this through an alliance, a royal marriage, and improved relations, and if you're the same religion. Um, otherwise, you're usually going to be taking vassals uh, violently. And the thing is about vassals as well, is you kind of don't want to take their core territory, because they'll never forgive you for it. <laughs> so just some notes on that. But going back to the main, the main reason you take vassals, by spending uh, Diplo points instead of admin, um, if you have the Art of War DLC, which I highly recommend you get just because it's probably the most important DLC for playing the game um, alongside Common Sense, is because then you can transfer provinces to your vassals uh, in a war, and you can actually, in the peace deal, give these provinces to your vassals, and they'll end up paying the administrative points to like core those provinces so that later on when you annex your vassal uh, and you'll want to later on uh, you can spend diplomatic points to get that land so in a way vassals are kind of like a land loan it's a loan of extra troops from manpower it's a loan of extra you know admin of admin points basically um, that you spend diplo points on instead of you know your, your precious admin points but there are also a lot of reasons to take vassals even if you don't want to save admin points, even if you, um, for example, if a nation that you attack isn't your religion or your culture and you don't want to spend the diplomatic points to accept a new culture or don't want to spend the money to deal with a religion that isn't yours, or if you don't want to deal with immediate rebellions from a war, vassalizing a country can be a very good way to get around this, especially depending on how small the nation is. Um, in the early game especially, and, and this is a trend you'll notice among vassals, is that they're much more useful in the early game than in the late game, uh, for a number of reasons, but one of them being that you don't have to deal with immediate like separatist rebellions when you take a country as a vassal um, and obviously this is extremely useful because in the early game you're really having to struggle more with manpower especially before you take something like quantity ideas or if you just get large enough and start building barracks everywhere having vassals really helps negate that vassals can also be a really good source of royal marriages if you're a monarchy 
Um, this can be a great way to avoid a succession crisis, especially if you're not a, a Muslim nation and don't get that um, ridiculous plus 200% uh, chance of error. I think it's 100% now, but um, having that large chance of a uh, new error uh, can really help against a succession crisis. Not not just in Europe, but anywhere in the world. Um, a good vassal, you know, of, uh, or a network of vassals, as I have um, in this case. Um, I have three vassals, which means that I get three royal marriages for free, which increases my chance of a new heir by 75%, uh, which is pretty powerful. Um, in addition to, of course, because they're vassals, they will always be dragged into your wars, um, and they'll always be helping you fight. So here in this scenario, we can see a situation where um, my nation isn't too big at 131. I, I would consider this to be a medium-small uh, nation at this point with Shenhui. Um, at this point, I have taken too many vassals. And so when you're smaller, you want to focus on having um, a lot of small vassals. And you don't really want to give those vassals too, too much land. You still want to focus on expanding for yourself um, and maybe annexing vassals as you go to take new ones later on because um, you don't want to, again, you don't want to deal with those rebellions and paying for those admin costs as much as you possibly can. But you still need to be taking land for yourself because, you know, if your vassals get too big, they end up rebelling. And as I said in this game, Arakan does eventually rebel by getting uh, independent support from Ming. Now let's look at a scenario where my country is a lot larger and talk about how vassals work um, and, and their relation to you if you're a larger nation. Okay, so this is about a hundred years later in the same save and as you can see I have done a couple of things that are, are a little bit different uh, when it comes to my vassals. So first of all, I've taken over most of the Indochina region and my development is up to 557. Uh, this means that my 57 development vassal Arakan and my 77 development vassal uh, Khmer, or Kumai as I've heard it pronounced, uh, Cambodia basically, um, they are much smaller than me. Uh, together, their combined unit is about 20% of my country. This means that their liberty desire is hilariously low, less than 10%, uh, and they're basically never going to rebel. So what advantages to do these provide to me at this point? Well, first of all, I'm at my max accepted culture limit, and because of the way cultures work in EU4, um, I can't actually accept Cambodian right now. So Khmer being here is extremely useful to me because I can't actually accept their culture right now and their land would be not that useful to me because I'm also at my state limit which is something I haven't even mentioned yet and it is another reason the vassals can be very powerful is they can still take full advantage of their land uh, even when you can't um, and so at, at 77 development they're actually able to provide about 12,000 troops in wars uh, because I have made Khmer a march now this is um, so when do you make a nation a march instead of a normal vassal. Well, one reason that you can make a nation a march is if they actually have enough development and good enough land to support troops. Because if they can support decent troops, then, you know, they are a good march. But also, in the case of Khmer here, and I did this intentionally, um, they get 10% morale of armies and 5% discipline. Um, as national ideas. So this is extremely useful uh, as a small nation to just kind of augment my forces a little bit, especially considering that I took quantity ideas uh, for the early game to kind of help myself get along. Now, as, as a larger nation, you still want to be taking vassals where you can, uh, just because, again, it does save you admin points. But the further the game gets along and the closer you get to improving your administrative efficiency through technology, although that can be troublesome outside of Europe because of institution tech cost, um, it's, it's still extremely useful to have vassals, uh, especially if you took influence ideas in the early game. You still get that 25% annexation cost reduction uh, for your vassals, which works like the 25% core cost reduction um, for admin ideas, uh, but instead, you know, works for vassals, obviously. Now, Khmer being my vassal, I can change this at any point that I want to, and because they're so small, their liberty, their liberty desire will shoot up by a lot, but it won't be enough for them to break free, basically, um, as I am now the dominant power in my area, and Ming is friendly to me, so it's unlikely that, really, there's going to be any issues with that. Now, just some final thoughts. Vassals are more of an early game concept than they are, or an early game 
mechanic than they are a late game mechanic uh, for a number of reasons, the largest of which being the administrative efficiency bonuses that you get as time passes. Eventually, provinces become so cheap to core with admin that needing to core them with diplomatic points actually becomes more expensive, costly, and timely um, than if you had just... Um, taken them with your with admin points even if you haven't taken administrative ideas um administrative efficiency gets so high anyway um especially if you use absolutism uh in the age of absolutism when it fires but i find that vassals can be a really good way to improve your play style i have a fr couple of friends who are new who never really take vassals and um you kind of using them as scapegoats obviously but um it's, it can be a way to drastically improve your your play style um now, I understand if you don't want to take vassals for, like, roleplay reasons or whatever. You know, this is a sandbox game, and in the end, nothing really matters, of course. But, um, vassals can be a very good way to improve uh, your skill as a player, and understanding them can help you uh, learn other parts of the diplomacy as well, uh, like with things such as personal unions. Um, if you find any of the following, you may want to take vassals more often. Uh, if your admin points are always low... Uh, I mean, when aren't they, though, right? Uh, you deal with way too many rebellions, and you really hate not having manpower. Uh, taking vassals helps deal with that. If you have issues getting heirs for your throne, uh, having loyal vassals of your religion um, and getting those royal marriages can really help you get heirs. And if you have trouble uh, finding alliances as well, the nice thing about vassals is that they're always going to help you um, unless their liberty desire is high. Thank you for watching if you made it this far into the video. I try to release a lot of newbie-friendly content just because I don't feel like anyone's really doing that anymore. Um, and there's just still so much that um, I don't think is on YouTube to kind of talk about how to actually play EU4. Um, there are introductory campaigns, of course, but I don't feel like those are as focused as a video like this that talk about certain mechanics that are really um, crucial and game-changing. And anyway, I hope that this was interesting, um, and maybe maybe you learned something, or maybe I've changed your mind about um, maybe your own playstyle, and maybe you realize that, wow, I would actually rather, you know, much rather spend Diplo points on vassals than I would admin points on land. Um, and yeah, if you, if you found this enjoyable, be sure to hit the like button. Uh, subscribe if you want to see more EU4 Let's Play content and guides in the future. Uh, and of course, if you want to support me, uh, hit me up on Discord, send me a private message, or consider supporting me on Patreon. This has been Darkfire Slide, and I'll see you on the next one.